those of you who are still standing, welcome back. We are now in week two, lecture one of our ongoing course on the American federal government. And if you will recall, last week we began with an introduction to some of the core concepts and central constitutional principles of the American government. Uh, but this week, we're going to start to move into a new segment of lecture dedicated to sort of the institutional structures of government in the United States. And that's where we're going to stay for the next week or two. More specifically, in this particular video, we're going to introduce the three branches of government and begin to discuss the first of these three branches. So in this video, we will set out to answer each of the following questions. Number one, what is the legislative branch and how is it structured? Number two, how do people tend to think and feel about the legislative branch of government? And number three, what are the main functions of the legislative branch and how does it go about fulfilling these functions? So what are the three branches of government and how are they distinct from one another? Well, remember from last week's lecture that branches of government are distinguished by their function. And that there are three functions that any government must be able to fulfill in order to functionally handle the day-to-day -day business of running a country. First, it needs to create the laws. And this function is going to be handled by the legislative branch. One way to remember this is to recall that the term legislate is just a fancy word for make laws. To legislate is to make a law. If you've ever heard the term legislation, you should know that a piece of legislation is just a bill, a proposed law that's being taken into consideration. If you've ever heard the word legislator, understand that a legislator is just somebody who makes laws. If you've ever heard the term legislature, that's going to be a body of people who make laws. Of course, in addition to creating the laws, we also have two other primary functions that governments have to fulfill. And thus, we've also got two other branches of government. We have the executive branch, which executes and enforces the law, as well as the judicial branch, which helps to interpret or resolve disputes about the law. But for now, we're going to start with the first of these three branches. And to do that, I want to solidify some of the language that we're going to use throughout today's lecture. So first, let's begin with the word bicameral. Recall from your reading that in the United States, we have a bicameral legislator. That means that there are two separate chambers or houses, in other words, bodies of elected officials, in our legislative branch. The legislative branch is more commonly known as the legislator, or Congress, and it is comprised of two separate groups of people. 435 representatives elected to serve in the lower chamber of Congress, the House of Representatives, and 100 senators elected to serve in the higher chamber of Congress, or the Senate. Now, I bring this up because there's a lot of confusion about the way that people use the term Congress. Many people tend to think that Congress is a synonym for the term House of Representatives, but that's not actually true. Congress is a synonym for the legislator, or the legislative branch as a whole. The House of Representatives is only one component of Congress. So understand that it does not make sense to say, and it is not accurate to say, that the legislative branch is made up of Congress and the Senate. It is more accurate to say, and it does make sense to say, that the legislative branch is comprised of the House and Senate. So the House is not the same thing as Congress. It's just one part of Congress. But that actually raises an interesting question. Why did the framers decide to include two separate chambers in the first place? Why not just have one really big chamber? Well, there are really a couple of reasons for this decision. There are a couple of ways that we could answer this question. Well, first, there's the historical question and the historical answer. Remember from your reading that our current legislative system is a product of the Great Compromise, which said that we would have a United States Senate modeled on the New Jersey plan, 
and a U.S. House of Representatives that would be based on the proportional model of representation proposed by the Virginia Plan. So this ties back into that point about how the Constitution is a negotiated document, a product of controversy and compromise. I'll briefly pause here to say that if you're having trouble following this, you need to make sure that you've kept up with your reading and lecture content from last week. In any case, the second reason for having a bicameral legislator is that it allows for a certain degree of specialization. The United States House and the United States Senate were, from the very start, intended to fulfill very different functions. The House of Representatives, again sometimes called the lower chamber, was designed to provide the American people with a delegate model of representation. We'll elaborate on this concept a little later, but basically what this means is that the House is supposed to be our voice in government. Its job is to give us what we want, and if our representatives aren't giving us what we want, well, we can just vote them out of office. So again, their job is, in fact, to give us what we demand of them. But the framers also recognize that what people want and what people need are not always going to be the same. So in addition to the directly elected House of Representatives, they created a Senate, which was supposed to provide us with a trusty model of representation. Basically, what this means is that the Senate is not supposed to worry about what people want so much as what it is that the people need, what is in the people's best interest. In fact, under the Constitution of 1787, we did not even have the right to elect our senators. Direct popular elections of senators did not come about until the 17th Amendment. So, originally, the House of Representatives was the only portion of the entire federal government where we chose our leaders through a direct democratic election. The third and final reason why we have a bicameral legislator relates to the second. Having an additional chamber helps add an extra layer of protection from bad policies. The idea here is that if a bill is not consistent with what the people want, it will be voted down by the House of Representatives. On the other hand, if a proposed law or policy is very popular but not altogether wise, it will hopefully be killed by the more seasoned Senate. This way we can assure that only the bills which are both good ideas and consistent with the will of the people will actually be passed into law and enforced upon us because neither chamber can ever create a law without the other chamber's consent. And that's not actually a bad segue into our next learning objective because one of the things that I do want you to be able to do after this lecture is to explain the relative lawmaking power of the two chambers of Congress. And this can sometimes be confusing to people for a couple of reasons. The first and most obvious reason why it can sometimes be confusing to people is that the House is, once more, sometimes known as the lower chamber, while the Senate is called the higher chamber. But what I want you to understand, what I want you to understand at this point, is that the two chambers of Congress are going to be co-equal in terms of their lawmaking authority. Neither one can make a law without the other's consent. They do, of course, sometimes have different responsibilities. For example, under the Constitution, any spending bill or law that creates a new tax must originate in the House of Representatives. Of course, it will eventually have to go through the Senate as well, but senators are not allowed to introduce a proposal which would increase taxes. Those, again, must first go through the House. Another big difference between the two chambers of Congress is that the Senate has the power of advice and consent. What that means is that they get to make recommendations and either confirm or reject the nominees that a president has selected for positions like a seat on the Supreme Court or as the United States ambassador to a foreign country. 
members of the House do not have any direct or formal role to play in this process. But this is best understood as a division of labor rather than a superiority of one chamber over the others. Again, and I cannot emphasize this enough, neither chamber can ever create a policy without the other's consent. All bills must be passed through both the House and the Senate in order to become law. In this sense, the two chambers are, once more, co-equal in their lawmaking authority. Neither one has more lawmaking authority than the other. So, while the Senate might be higher, that does not mean that it is greater. What then do we mean when we say that the Senate is higher in this context? Well, generally speaking, what we mean is that it is more prestigious and further detached from the base of power. The Senate is more prestigious than the House because it is smaller. Remember, because of the Great Compromise, we have exactly two senators that represent every state, regardless of that state's population. That means that we have a total of exactly 100 senators. By contrast, because the House of Representatives is proportional to population, most states have several representatives, and some states even have dozens of representatives. As a result, there are 435 seats in the House of Representatives. It's substantially larger as a body. What this means is that it's a lot easier to get into the House of Representatives than it is to get into the Senate. Because when you're trying to get into the House of Representatives, you have more openings available. Imagine that the Senate and the House are each a university. Each one has exactly 5,000 applicants, but only a handful of available openings. The Senate has 100 available openings, and the House has 435. Which one do you think would be easier to get into? Which one do you think would be more competitive? Well, clearly, the Senate would be more competitive, would be much more difficult to get into, because you're competing with roughly the same number of applicants for less than one-fourth the overall number of openings. So getting into the Senate is, again, much harder. It requires a lot more effort, time, energy, and yes, if we're honest, money. As a result, senators tend to gain a great deal of prestige, more prestige than what we see in the House of Representatives, in the same way that a Harvard graduate gets more prestige than a Southeastern Oklahoma State University graduate. And that's not to say that they get a better education. I do firmly believe that you can get a much better education at a smaller, more personalized university where we professors have at least some time to spend one-on-one -on -one with each student individually. But again, the Senate is higher, first in the sense that it has greater prestige, not in the sense that it is more powerful or more valuable or more meaningful. The Senate is also higher in the sense that it is further from the base of power. Think about this in architectural terms. The base of a structure is the bottom, or the foundation of that structure. And what is the base or foundation of power in a democratic country like the United States? Why, it's the people. It's us. Remember that point about the social contract and the preamble of our Constitution from last week's lecture. Remember, senators were not originally elected by the people. The Senate was made to be insulated from the will of the people so that it did not have to worry about what the people wanted and could instead focus on what they needed, even if that wasn't very popular. In this way, they're less directly representative of the people's will. They are more insulated from the people, so they are further from us. And if you're further from the base, that means that you are higher. So we say that the Senate is higher because, again, it is further detached from the people. It is less representative than the House of Representatives, at least in theory. But once again, that does not mean that the Senate has more power than the House or that the House has more power than the Senate. 
Senators might get more prestige, but they aren't endowed with any kind of additional lawmaking authority, and they still need the House to support them if they're going to get anything done. All right, now that we know what the legislative branch is and how it's structured into two separate chambers, as well as how these chambers relate to one another in their co-equal lawmaking authority, let's take a second to discuss how people tend to feel about the legislative branch. Now, remember from your reading that the legislative branch is the most democratic portion of government. We actually elect our representatives and, since the 17th Amendment, our senators. But we do not elect the president, at least not directly. He's going to be selected by the Electoral College. And we do not directly elect our judges either. They are, by and large, nominated by the president and confirmed by the Senate. So we find that the legislative branch tends to be the portion of the government which is the most concerned with what the people want and what the people need. Yet, despite this, we're also going to find that the most democratic branch of our government is the least popular by a very wide margin. By and large, the American people are extremely dissatisfied with the leadership that Congress provides. In a typical year, only about 15% of Americans will say that they approve of Congress's job performance, which means that Congress is literally less popular than Nickelback and roaches, and root canals, and a whole bunch of other things described in one of your optional readings from Politico for this week. So I'd suggest taking a look at that article. But what we're going to find is that this is somewhat puzzling. How is it possible that Congress can simultaneously be the most democratic and yet the least popular branch of our federal government? Well, as it turns out, we tend to like our congressmen and our congresswomen, but not Congress as a whole. And that makes sense, if you think about it, because we don't elect Congress as a whole. We get to elect our members of Congress. People in Oklahoma's 2nd Congressional District only select one of the 435 delegates in the United States House of Representatives. People in Texas only get to choose two out of the Senate's total 100 senators. But we don't just elect anybody. We elect candidates that we like, who we find relatable, and who share our values or our issue positions. But the issue positions and values of the people electing, say, California senators in California aren't always going to have the same uh, values or ideas as those of Texans electing Texas senators. So this is inherently going to create conflict. When we elect somebody, we're sending them to Washington, D.C. with a mission. Congressman Mark Wayne Mullen of Oklahoma's 2nd Congressional District, for example, promised to get the government off the backs of small businesses in our states when he ran for office. And to his credit, after getting elected, he seems to have made a genuine effort to do so. Now, whether he's just standing up for small businesses because he wants to get reelected, or because he is himself a businessman, or because he thinks it's the right thing, is something that I cannot say. I'll let you make up your mind about that on your own. But does the fact that Congressman Mullen wants to reduce regulations and that we sent him to Washington, D.C. because he promised that he would reduce regulations mean that regulations have actually been reduced since he got elected? No. Indeed, during that time period, regulations have increased. Again, this isn't because Mark Wayne Mullen hasn't tried, but... It's because he's just one guy in a body of 435 other elected officials. And that frustrates us. We sent him to fulfill a mission, deregulation, and he's not able to do so despite his best efforts because of the way Congress is structured. Because of the way Congress is structured, Congressman Mark Wayne Mullen is being prevented from doing what we want him to by other elected officials 
chosen to represent people from other states that want very, very different things. And of course, this is going to create a great deal of deadlock. We will find increasingly that Republicans and Democrats in Congress are unwilling to cross party lines and work together. They're less willing to compromise and do tend to be more extreme on their issue positions than they used to be. Which again, we find frustrating. It frustrates us because it means that nothing's getting done. We have problems that we want solved and the government isn't addressing them because Congress can't agree on what the best solutions to these problems actually are. Now, I, don't want, I do want to briefly pause and point out that while we tend to blame this on the people in Congress, it isn't altogether their fault. Certainly, partisan bickering seems to be a part of the equation, but the fact of the matter is that our framers intentionally created a legislative branch that was designed to create this kind of gridlock. And we're going to talk about why a little later on, but before we delve into that matter, let's move on to our next learning objective. One of the things that I want you to be able to do at the end of this lecture is to identify the major roles of the legislative branch, as well as the critical concepts, core characteristics, and controversies associated with each of these. And on this slide, I've uh, provided you with a list of the roles I want you to be familiar with. Now, we've already touched on the first and most important. The legislative branch makes the laws. But what we're going to do moving forward is discuss specifically how it goes about doing so. What are the steps that a proposed policy must go through before it becomes law? We'll also spend some time discussing whether or not Congress is actually good at fulfilling this lawmaking role. Once we covered all of that, we'll delve into the second major role that Congress plays, representation. Again, Congress is the most democratic portion of the federal government. It is here so that we can directly elect leaders and, at least in theory, gather together to, uh, to promote and protect our wants, needs, and interests in the government. And then, of course, there are the more minor roles that Congress fulfills in our government. We're not going to spend too much time on these, as they are covered quite well by your textbook and aren't as critical to the functionality of Congress. But at the end of our lecture, we will briefly touch upon each of them and some associated controversies before we close our lecture for the day. So, one final time, the number one most important function and the defining duty of Congress is to create the laws that we, the American people, live under. This is their chief constitutional charge, and this is the main thing that they're going to do. But what we're going to find is that historically, Congress has never been very efficient at getting things done, at creating new laws. If you look at the data from 2015 to 2017, for example, you'll find that of more than 12,000 bills that were proposed formally in Congress, only about 300 of them were actually passed into law. So while Congress is theoretically supposed to be creating new laws, they don't do so as much as some people would like. And this is one reason why many people are critical of Congress and its job performance. But it's worth taking a moment to consider whether this is a fair criticism. Because while it is true that the vast majority of bills do fail, that's not necessarily a bad thing. One way to look at those statistics that I just gave you is to say, look how much time Congress has wasted on proposals that it ultimately kills. They're just voting everything down. Look at all of these good bills that they could have passed and used to solve our problems. But another way that you might look at those exact same statistics is to say, hey, Congress is doing a really good job. Look at all of these bad bills that they saved us from. I sure am glad that our elected officials don't just willy-nilly approve whatever policies are proposed to them. It's good to see that they have stringent standards. In other words, we don't just want Congress to make any law. We want it to make good laws. 
If somebody's proposed a policy that would hurt us or that would go against our will, well, then we might actually want Congress to shoot that proposal down. And by and large, that is what Congress seems to do with these very controversial, usually quite unpopular proposals or bills. At the same time, it is important to note that one of the main reasons why Congress isn't good at getting things done is that it has to operate within a framework that was designed for the sole purpose of impeding government action, of making it hard to get things done. Remember, the framers did not want a very big or very active government. They wanted a very limited government that had as little impact on the daily lives of citizens as possible. What they realized was that every time we create a new law, that's some measure of freedom taken away from the people. By definition, if you create a rule mandating or prohibiting something, you're taking away a person's freedom to do or abstain from doing that thing. And the framers wanted to keep these limits on our freedom to the absolute bare minimum necessary to protect individuals from force and fraud to ensure the maximum amount of freedom enjoyable by an individual without violating the freedoms of anybody else. So when they drafted the Constitution, they intentionally made a legislative process that was extremely complex and fundamentally designed to create debate, argument, and gridlock. Which, of course, raises two other questions. The first question that it raises is, why did they want a complicated system? Well, one reason that they wanted such a complicated system is that it helps to ensure that we do not live under bad or arbitrary laws. In other words, the first reason for a complicated process of legislation, of legislating, is to protect us from bad policies. Only the absolutely most popular, well-thought-out proposals can actually pass because this is a very rigorous process. The second reason why the framers wanted a system of gridlock in the legislature is that, while frustrating, this kind of gridlock helps to ensure the people have enough time to weigh in on the issues. If Congress could just pass laws willy-nilly, they might create so many policies that we can't keep up with them all. Then we wouldn't really be able to hold our leaders accountable for those decisions or tell them what we thought about a proposal before they voted on it. Furthermore, we wouldn't really have very much time to figure things out. When we create gridlock, the process is slowed down, yes, but that means that we've got more time, a greater opportunity to hear both sides make their own cases. You can listen to the Republicans arguing for X and the Democrats arguing for Y, and then before deciding where to stand on an issue, weigh in the information that both sides of the aisle has presented. So we want or might want a complicated system that creates gridlock to protect us from bad policies, limit government activity, and to promote public deliberation. But the next question our observations raise is quite simple. What exactly does this convoluted procedure for making a law actually look like? Well, students, I'm glad that you asked. The first step in the legislative process is to get your bill, your proposed law, formally introduced. You need to have it formally introduced to either the House or the Senate. Now, anyone can write or propose a bill, but only a congressperson can formally introduce that bill. And the president cannot formally introduce a bill. The congressperson who introduces a bill is what we call that bill's author, regardless of whether or not he or she actually wrote the bill. It is also important to note that members can only introduce a bill to their own chamber. A representative can introduce a bill to the House. A senator can introduce a bill to the Senate, but neither can cross over to the other side's chamber. So let's say that you want to propose a new sales tax of one cent per dollar to increase education. You've got a penny tax. 
Well, the first step in this process for you would be to find a representative in the house who is willing to sign on as the author of your bill. Now, it does in this case have to begin in the house because, recall, all tax bills must begin in the lower chamber. Other bills can begin in the Senate, but since this is a tax bill, we will start in the House of Representatives. And if you can't find at least one member of the House willing to introduce your bill to the House, your proposal dies. But what happens if you do find somebody who will introduce your bill for you? Well, the next step is for the bill to be sent to a committee. A committee is a small panel of specialists selected from among the chamber's general membership to make an initial ses assessment of any new legislation. In this case, for example, we're looking at a tax bill. So we'd probably go to the Budgetary Committee. The House Budgetary Committee is comprised of House representatives who have a special expertise or particular interest in budget-related legislation, such as our tax proposal. And their job is to review your proposed policy to see whether it is even worth bringing to the floor for full consideration by the chamber as a whole. They'll do this during a process called committee markup. During committee markup, the author who introduced the bill will present it to the relevant committee. Committee members will have time to ask questions, and then they will consider any ways in which the bill might be improved. Any member of the committee can propose changes, which the committee as a whole will vote on. These changes can amend, remove, or add new language, and sometimes wind up completely reworking the basic function and intent of the bill. But sticking with our basic premise, with our educational tax example, we might presume that one of our committee members determines that one penny per dollar won't raise enough money to fulfill our desired purpose of funding education. So he or she might propose an amendment, raising it from a penny tax to a nickel tax, five cents on every dollar. If the amendment passes a majority vote in the committee, the bill is changed. Once the committee is done changing a bill, the next step is for the committee to vote on that bill as a whole, as amended during the markup process. If they agree to pass the bill with all of its new language and amendments, then the bill moves on to the next step. But if they do not agree to pass the bill, then it's dead. Let's assume, however, that our nickel tax does survive. The next step is for the House leadership to schedule our bill for consideration by the entire body of the House of Representatives as a whole, every single member. House leadership can, at this point, unilaterally kill a bill simply by refusing to move forward with it. If they don't put it on the schedule for consideration, it will not be considered, and for all practical purposes, it is again dead. But if they do agree to move forward, the next step is for a full markup in which every member of the House is given an opportunity to consider, debate, and amend the bill. They can, again, propose whatever changes they want to the bill, but each proposed change requires a majority vote to actually alter the language of that piece of legislation. Maybe, for example, somebody decides that while well, one cent per dollar might be not enough, uh, five cent per dollar is just too much. He or she could then propose uh, an amendment changing the amount from five cent uh, down to 2.5 cent on the dollar, and then the whole body will vote yes or no, shall we make this change? If a majority agrees, the bill is changed. Otherwise, the language stays the same as it was after the bill was released from committee. Then every representative gets to vote either yes or no on whether to move forward with the bill again as amended during this process of floor debate and markup. If they say yes, well then you go over to the other side, in this case the Senate, and you start all the way over. You have to go through each and every one of those same steps in the Senate. This can become problematic. Because what we're going to discover is that the Senate will now have a number of opportunities to make its own changes to the bill. And these changes will be made without 
approval from the House. Maybe, for example, one senator decides to bring our tax back up to five cents again. Right? So they're introducing an amendment to raise the 2.5 cent tax per dollar back to five cent per dollar. And this amendment passes, and then the bill is approved by the Senate. Well, now we have two different proposals. We have a 2.5 cent tax passed by the House of Representatives and a 5 cent tax passed by the Senate. But neither of these proposals has been approved by both chambers. Each one has been approved by one chamber, but neither has been approved by both the House and the Senate. Now, historically, what this meant was that the Senate bill would then be sent back to the House and go through the process again. But this created a dilemma we called the uh, issue of legislative ping pong. Basically, legislative ping pong means that the Senate will send the bill back to the House, the House will undo the Senate's changes and send it back, the Senate will add those changes into the bill again, and so on and so forth, ad infinitum. The solution to this problem, to legislative ping pong, was to add another step in the process, which we call the conference committee. A conference committee is a special type of committee. Its members are selected from both chambers of the legislator, and they meet in secret for the purpose of reconciling differences between the House version of the bill and the Senate version of the bill. They are, again, allowed to make whatever changes they want, and that makes them very powerful, because once they are done with the bill, they send it back to both chambers. And each chamber now has to vote yes or no on whether to pass the bill as amended by the conference committee. Once the conference committee is done, nobody else is allowed to make any changes. Is yes or no, period. So if you're on the conference committee, you can really have a lot of influence since nobody's allowed to undo your changes. Either way, once you're done with the conference committee, the bill must be voted on by each chamber individually. And if either chamber says no, you're done. The bill is dead. And once again, you'll have to start all the way over. Just like that, all of your work has been wasted. But even if both chambers say yes, you're still not done. Then you've got to go to the White House. At which point, the president can either sign or veto the bill. If he signs it, the bill becomes law. If he vetoes it, the bill dies. Now, technically, a veto can be overridden, but that's very hard and exceptionally rare. It does happen. It happened, for example, to Barack Obama. But in most cases, if the president vetoes your bill, again, it, it's probably just going to be dead. So... One final time, what we can see here is that this is a very complicated, extremely difficult, and fairly drawn-out process that creates lots of opportunities for debate and argument, and which requires that any proposed bill survive a large number of individual steps and stages if it's going to become a law. And if it fails, any one of these steps anywhere along the line of this process, it's dead. It doesn't become a law. You have to pass every single step on both sides and get the president's approval before the policy will be passed into law. In this way, the framers crafted a legislative process which helps to protect us from bad policy and gives us a chance to participate in the public discourse about a proposal by slowing down the gears of government. Again, we sometimes find this frustrating because the government isn't passing laws, and if it's not passing laws, it might not be solving our problems. But that's exactly how the framers wanted it. They did not want us to rely on the force of law, on the government, to solve all of our problems because they were afraid of what that would mean for our freedoms. Having more laws, however well-meaning they may be, ultimately means that the government has greater control over the way that we live our lives. So to limit that, the framers intentionally made this very complicated process. And that summarizes our discussion of the lawmaking function of Congress.
Now that we've discussed the lawmaking function, let's delve into the representation function or role of Congress. Because remember what I told you, we don't just want Congress to create any old laws. We want to have some voice in this process, some say in the decisions about what laws we do and do not live under. And given that Congress is the most democratic branch of the government, it tends to be the easiest place for us to find this voice, the easiest place for us to influence, and the most concerned with representing the wants, needs, and interests of the people. But it's important to understand that the word represent has many different meanings in the English language. For example, when we say that we want our legislators to represent us, we don't mean that we want them to represent us in the same way that, for example, a dot might represent Oklahoma City on a map. That's a very different type of representation, linguistically speaking. And this linguistic ambiguity is important because different people and different elected leaders are going to have varying ideas about what representation means and what types of representation the government should focus on providing to us. For example, one big distinction that we need to make is the distinction between substantive representation and descriptive representation. We'll start with substantive representation. To provide substantive representation is to create policies that comply with the wants, needs, and interests of the people. A government is substantively representative of the people when the policies that it creates and the results of its elections reflect popular interests. And what we're going to find is that Congress is actually pretty good at supplying substantive representation. The policies that a congressman or a congresswoman seeks to pass do, by and large, tend to coincide with the wants and needs of their constituents. If you don't know, the word constituent is just a fancy word for voter. You will want to be familiar with that because it's pretty common vocabulary in political discourse. Okay? So a constituent is a voter, and by and large, congresspersons do their best to provide their voters with substantive representation. And taking that into consideration, it makes sense why members of Congress might want to make sure that they're providing representation in a substantive sense of the word. Because what political scientists have learned is that, and this is important, the number one goal of every elected official is to get reelected. Again, that's a really important point. We call this principle Mayhew's number one goal of the elected official because the concept was first given its full academic articulation by a scholar named David Mayhew. But what's really important about Mayhew's number one goal of the elected official is that it helps us to understand why politicians actually care about what we think. Why don't they just do what is in their own best interest? What do you suppose would happen if, for example, Congressman Mullen of Oklahoma's 2nd Congressional District refused to comply with the wishes and needs of his voters? Instead of deregulating business, he started increasing regulations. Instead of supporting the Second Amendment, he started opposing the Second Amendment. What would we do? Well, we'd vote him out of office. So he has to provide us with substantive representation if he wants to achieve his number one goal getting reelected. But the same logic does not apply to the next type of representation that we're going to talk about. Descriptive representation is when the people in government look like the general population that they are governing. If 50% of the general population is male, 50% female, a descriptively representative Congress would be one comprised half of men and half of women. So, if substantive representation is government for the people, then descriptive representation is government by the people. Substantive representation gives us a voice in government by advocating for our policy preferences and needs. 
Descriptive representation gives us a face in government by making sure that each of the meaningful populations in our country is present and holds a proportional share of the government's decision-making positions. Now, what we're going to find is that descriptive represent representation is very passive. As an elected official, I can supply descriptive representation without ever voting on a bill just by having the same demographics as my voters. In Oklahoma, for example, if I am a white, Republican, Second Amendment supporting Christian, that would mean that just by getting elected, I am supplying voters with descriptive representation. But that does not mean that you, as an elected official who is white, Republican, and Christian, will actually pass policies that white Republicans and Christians want or need. Uh, similarly, you can be an African-American elected to represent people in a very black area like Baltimore and yet not pass any policies that help black people. In fact, you could theoretically possibly wind up passing a bunch of policies that are more helpful for white people. Okay, So remember that descriptive representation is passive. Okay, It doesn't require any actual action or effective behavior on your part as an elected official. Uh, the second thing to remember about descriptive representation is that it tends to be extremely poor in Congress because by and large people are more concerned with whether they receive substantive than descriptive representation. In other words, we're more likely to vote somebody out of office because the policies that they promote don't sound like the policies that we want them to, pr uh, to promote than we are to try and kick somebody out of office because they don't share our gender or race. So a elected official can achieve Mayhew's number one goal by providing substantive description, but probably cannot achieve that goal by providing descriptive representation. Conversely, he or she can get away with not providing descriptive representation and still getting reelected, but would have a much more difficult time achieving that goal of reelection without providing any form of substantive representation. You have to give the people what they want, regardless of whether or not you actually look like those people if you want to get reelected. But descriptive representation is arguably still very important for two reasons. One, studies do tend to show that when descriptive representation increases, so does substantive representation. These two are closely related. When you elect more women, for example, we find that the wants, needs, and interests of women tend to be given more attention in government. So descriptive representation can be a means to an end. At the same time, some people argue that it may be an end in and of itself. There is some concern that if we do not supply descriptive representation, we're sending a message of exclusion to certain segments of the population. For example, many feminists fear that the general lack of women in Congress might signal to our daughters that politics and leadership are best left to men. And that can cause some problems for the way that our society views women and for the way that women in our society view themselves. Either way, understand that the difference between these two types of representation is that one provides us with a voice, whereas the other provides us with a face in government. Okay? Now, there is another distinction that needs to be made. More specifically, we need to look at the difference between trustees and delegates in government. The big difference here has to do with our beliefs about the proper role of an elected official. Under the trustee model of representation, our elected officials are chosen by voters to do what is in the people's best interest rather than simply complying with what the people want. In this model, elected leaders are chosen because voters trust them to exercise sound judgment and to exhibit benevolent professional expertise necessary to make policies which, while not necessarily popular, will ultimately work out in our own best interest. 
Now, there are some good and bad things about this model of representation. One potential benefit to this is that it puts the emphasis on making good policies rather than just playing good politics or making popular policies. A trustee isn't just going to cave to popular pressure or public opinion. They're going to factor in the values that they campaigned on, their own beliefs and expertise to give the people what they need, even if that's not what the people want which can be a potentially good thing because what the people want doesn't always come out in their own best interest. But this also leads to the, the flip side. It is true that what's popular or what the people want and what's in the people's best interests are not always the same. But it is also true that our elected officials can sometimes be a bit out of touch with the interests of the people because they're not living our lives. They're living the lives of politicians, of political elites in public office. So a potential problem with the trustee model of representation is that it is somewhat elitist in that it assumes that these political elites who represent us in our government know what's in our best interest better than we do. And that's not necessarily true. Just as what we believe is in our best interest is not always actually in our best interest, so too can we say that politicians sometimes think that policies will help us when in fact those policies are going to hurt us. And at the same time, as the name implies, this trusty model of representation requires that we place a great deal of faith or trust in our elected officials. You have to trust that your elected official not only knows what's in your best interest, even if they don't live the life that you're living, but that he or she will act on this knowledge. You have to trust that he or she will act benevolently. In order for the trustee model of representation to work, our elected leaders have to not only identify but prioritize our interests over their own. It's not just enough to know what the people need. You have to actually give them what they need, even if that's not in your own best interest. And what we're going to discover is that politicians aren't usually very willing to do that. As a general rule, most of them will at least occasionally cave to political pressure or public opinion to pursue their own goal of getting re-elected. And what that means is that they are at least sometimes going to act like delegates rather than trustees. In the delegate model of representation, our elected officials just give the people what they want. That's it. They trust that the people have a better understanding of what's in our own best interest than the politicians that we send to Washington, and so they simply comply with those wishes and hope that it works out for the best. They don't get to exercise much discretion. They're essentially middlemen. We tell them to jump, and they ask how high. Their own opinions, beliefs, preferences, or perspectives about what's right or what's in our own best interest don't factor into the decision at all. They give us what we want, regardless of what they think we need. And again, there can be some pros and cons to this. The downside here is that, again, what's popular and what's wise aren't always the same. If you're always just caving to public opinion, your policies are going to be pretty capricious. Public opinion is constantly fluctuating, constantly changing, so you're going to wind up flip-flopping a lot and sometimes passing really bad or just contradictory policies from one year to the next. As a result, people will accuse you as an elected official of lacking principles and just doing whatever it takes to get elected. On the flip side, the delegate model doesn't require us to put as much faith or wisdom, uh, much faith in the wisdom or benevolence of our leaders. If they're just doing what we tell them to do, we don't have to worry about an abuse of power in the same way that we might if we had put our faith in a trustee. So, which model of representation do we have in the United States? Well, in all honesty, we have neither. We have some combination of the two. We've got a little bit of both. It's very rare to see any elected official who is always a delegate or always a trustee. 
And to understand why, we'll refer back to that number one goal that Mayhew identified. Politicians want, above all else, to get re-elected. And what they realize is that, is that if they always ignore what the people want, they're going to get voted out of office. So they can't always be a trustee. On the other hand, if they always ignore what's in the people's best interest, what the people need, over time, their policies are going to start to hurt us. If they're passing laws that are hurting you, uh, if they're passing laws that are harming us, do you think that we'll just take responsibility and acknowledge that it's our fault since we're the ones that told them to pass those policies? No, of course not. This is America. We don't take responsibility for our own actions. We're going to blame them, and again, they'll be voted out of office. So, in order to achieve their number one goal of getting reelected, virtually all elected officials will cycle between these two models of representation as the need arises. And that pretty much brings to an end our discussion of representation. Understand that we want representation from Congress, but that different people do have different understandings of what this means, or in other words, some of us want very different types of representation from our government. In reality, our government provides us a little bit of descriptive, a little bit of substantive representation. It sometimes acts as a, uh, in accordance with the trustee model of representation, sometimes in accordance with the delegate model of representation. But now what we can do is quickly wrap up by briefly touching upon the four minor functions of Congress. And I do want you to be familiar with these as well. Remember that the two biggest functions that Congress fulfills, the two biggest roles that it plays, are lawmaking and representation. But in addition to these roles, Congress has come to play a few other roles in our system of governance. First, Congress provides oversight for the government. That means that in addition to passing the laws, they at least try to make sure that those laws are being implemented in the right way. So, for example, during the government shutdown of 2013, a number of national parks were closed down by various bureaucracies which did not have congressional authorization to do so. They had been told by Congress to keep those parks open, and they decided to close them instead. Now, the bureaucracies claimed that they had to shut the parks down because they lacked the funds to keep them open. And if that's true, fine. But there was some evidence to suggest that the decision had been a political one. So to figure out whether the bureaucracies had behaved appropriately, Congress launched a series of investigations in which they began to search through the correspondences of various government decision makers. They also had public hearings in which they called these decision makers to testify before a committee and publicly explain their actions. All of this was to determine whether the decision to shut down these parks had been in violation of federal laws. So Congress was providing oversight. But there's something of a controversy here. Because at the end of the day, Congress has very little power to actually enforce its decision regardless of what it uncovers during these hearings and, uh, or investigations. So there is some concern that these hearings and investigations have become more about politics than policy or actual oversight. It's a chance for, some would argue, elected the leaders to engage in political theater and try to win votes from their home states and districts. Second, Congress provides public education. Remember, one of the main reasons why the framers designed such a slow, gridlocking, and complicated process for lawmaking is that this creates ample opportunity for debate and discussion, for public deliberation. And we, as American citizens, have access to all of the information that these debates and discussions provide. If you wanted to, for example, you could actually watch all of the debates on the House and Senate floor live by simply turning in to C-SPAN and leaving that on your TV. Or if you're close to DC, you could actually go in and sit down in the gallery. Those congressional hearings and investigations we discussed are also conducted publicly. So again, you can get a great amount of information simply by paying attention to those sources provided to us by Congress. This 
public process of policy making does mean that politics will sometimes get in the way of compromise but it also means that we have a chance to hear both sides make their arguments and bring out their own stats before we decide where we want to stand on an issue so it's educating the problem with this public education rule of congress is that people don't pay attention you can watch a floor debate but how many of you have ever actually done so uh, since we don't pay attention we usually rely on third parties like the media to collect information for us but of course there's always going to be a slight slant or bias or twist or spin to the way these debates hearings investigations so on and so forth are covered and therefore we're not really getting any good direct or accurate information despite congress's best efforts third congress provides conflict resolution our country is very diverse there's a large number of people and a large number of different disparate groups each of which has its own set of unique wants needs and interests and sometimes what one group or person wants or needs from the government conflicts with what another group or person wants or needs from the government so there's going to be inherent conflict in a large diverse country like the united states but Congress gives us a way to civilly resolve these disagreements in a peaceful manner. In a state of anarchy, if there was a disagreement, a conflict between what was in my best interest and what was in your best interest, we might have to duke it out. But because we in the United States have a representative democracy, that's not necessary. Instead of fighting, we can elect officials to work things out on our behalf by arguing over policy proposals in Congress. Pretty straightforward. Finally, Congress, uh, or rather congressional offices, provide constituent services. The most obvious example of a service provided to constituents by Congress or rather congressional offices is going to be what we call casework casework basically involves using staffers employed by the office of a particular congressman or woman to help voters in that congressperson's district by providing them with assistance in interfacing with government agencies so for example if you've got a problem with a va claim that you filed and you can't figure out why you're not getting the money you feel that you're entitled to receive one thing that you could do is contact your congressman's local office and have a staffer reach out to the VA on your behalf. They'll gather information, serve as your advocate, and help you to navigate this bureaucratic labyrinth until you can get what you want, need, or are entitled to receive. Now that's casework. Now, on the other hand, uh, on the one hand, I should say, casework can be seen as a good thing. It's a way for our elected officials to help us solve the problems that we face in daily life, which some would argue is what they're supposed to do. But there's also a problem with this. The staffers which provide these services are paid by public tax dollars. And that's a problem because providing casework or other favors to constituents can be a way for an elected official to try and earn votes. If I help you to navigate your claim with the VA, you're probably going to be grateful when you get your money and therefore more likely to vote for me in my next election. Which means that the taxpayers, including those who oppose me, are basically being made to help me get reelected. We're essentially funneling public money back into my campaign effort by using tax dollars to pay staffers that provide favors which convince voters to support me. And that is again potentially problematic. One way or the other, then, what we will find is that Congress plays a large number of roles in our system of governance, and that many of these roles can be quite controversial. But at the end of the day, the two most important roles are lawmaking and representation, whereas the other roles are fairly minor. I'm going to go ahead and close off here, but I'll see you again in Lecture B for this week when we get together to discuss the judicial branch.